Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, we're going to bring it down a little bit out of the technology realm a little bit after that. Um, trust me, I talk with uh, Ed Mays on a regular basis. He brings the uh, quantum com computing and everything down to my level, so it's an amazing conversation. Uh, but this afternoon, I have the honor of introducing the Workforce Fireside Chat uh, between um, Executive Director Peter Hawkes and Chief Aguilar. Um, and they had me introducing Chief Aguilar. I don't think anybody in this room needs me to introduce Chief Aguilar, but I will tell you, and we were just talking about, he said he remembers me a lot younger. I was over 20 years ago, uh, but starting my 30th year in government service, and um, Chief Aguilar has been my chief for most of, most of that before, for a very long time, so, um, and workforce care is his number one goal. Uh, but, Peter Hawk is, if you don't know him, executive director now. He also grew up within the Border Patrol. Um, last, before I brought him over to run Workforce Care, he was the acting chief patrol agent for El Paso um, during the beginnings of the surges that you see now. Um, so Pete has a lot of experience in, in the Border Patrol and working with the, the workforce. Before I turn it over to them, I want to take a little deeper dive into our agency's workforce efforts, the Workforce Care. Um, Obviously, the workforce is our greatest asset. I mean, we all know that, right? You heard them say, you always got to have the human in the loop, right? The, the computer should not be making those decisions. And we were talking backstage a little bit about the, the, the pressures of if you're getting all this information all the time and having to be right all the time, um, and the expectation is if you have more information, you're going to be right all the time. That's a huge stress on the workforce. Um, and they're feeling it. Um, but it's not just about the employees, it's also to strengthen the well-being of their families as well, because it's it's gotta be home and work together because that, that stress uh, re reverberates. So initiatives that support the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, the health resources, are the investment in mission readiness. And that mission readiness is what helps them get their job done. Uh, so CBP strives to be a model across the federal government for how an agency should care for its workforce. Uniformed and non-uniformed employees alike experience that work, workplace-related stress that we're talking about. But as a law enforcement agency, the demands of our mission often take a toll on the employees and their families. So by continuing to improve that access to resources and instituting the risk management practices, CBP is establishing that culture that prioritizes that physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health of the employees and their families. So we're gonna to continue to engage with the employees across the agency to better identify and understand those common individual and organizational sources of stress. Like I mentioned, that the, the feeling that you have to be right all the time and faster and better every single day. So although CBP may never eliminate all those adverse stressors, uh, we're gonna provide the well-being resources to lessen those stressors and increase the resilience. Um, so the long-term improvements and the employee wellness and resilience necessitate cultural change. That stigma of asking for help is particularly strong in law enforcement agencies. Um, we're really not good at asking for help whenever you're the person that usually people ask help from. Um, it's a terrible stigma. We're getting through that. That's one of our main focuses. Um, but we're striving to create that culture that consistently reinforces and encouraging, encourages the, the help-seeking behaviors. Um, so we're focusing on building trust which is a key part, you'll hear a lot of that from Pete today, building that trust so the employees have confidence that they'll receive the care and the support they need um, within the jobs and at home. Um, removing the barriers to seeking help, you hear a lot about that, and fostering that culture of trust enables CBP employees to operate, the, operate at their best. So I'd like to turn it over to Chief Aguilar and XD Jaquez now. Thank you all very much. I'm gonna let them do the talking on this one. and. Um, We've heard a lot about operational requirements, operational needs, but nobody could have put it better than the chief when he sat here this morning. With every piece of equipment that we had, what we envisioned, we cannot do the job with the most critical part of our organization. That's our men and women. That's our men and women. They are the most critical part. They're the key to getting the job done and continuing to get better at what we do. That's why I was excited to have Pete, Peter here with me, and uh, Chief Scudder. Uh, we've known each other for many, many years. Uh, we were a lot younger or some thinner, <laughs> more hair. But if there's one thing I can say about both of these individuals is it is about getting involved in the job that they do, 
I know both of them to be individuals that wouldn't be doing this job unless their heart was in it. Peter here has been uh, a leader throughout his career. He's been a strategist. I want to ask you a little bit about that here in a second. But I can think of no better individual to be heading up this new workforce wellness directorate because I know he cares. I know he's been in the field. I know he himself has been tested, as I have, as Chief Scudder has been tested. Uh, life balance, challenges, everything else that's there. This is a new directorate. It is something that we've needed for a long, long time. And I'm, I'll pass it on to him to open it up here in just a second. But we spoke in the hallway a few minutes ago. Uh, I started in the Border Patrol a long time ago. Looking back to when I first started off, I wish we had back then what, Peter, you are bringing to the forefront. Because there were so many men and women that needed this kind of support, and we just didn't have it. And the rest of us that were in leadership positions didn't have, not that we didn't have the time, we were being overcome by so many other activities that we just couldn't de dedicate the time that, uh, that we needed to. So let me hand it over to you. Give us a sense of what it is you're doing, your vision, what your responsibilities are, and anything else you'd like industry to hear. Well, Chief, first of all, thank you. I appreciate you having me uh, come out and uh, participate in this event. I think it's important to, to get the word out on what CBP is doing, uh, specifically in terms of the wellness and resilience of our workforce. You know, I want to I take a couple of minutes to kind of frame the picture of what, what CBP has going on right now. We're a workforce of over 64,000 people. And, you know, when you look back at the history of CBP, we're relatively young in, as, as it relates to government service. We're 20 years old. But here we are making headway on a lot of pieces that, that you know, go from technology to operations to now wellness and resilience, which I think is, it speaks volumes to our leadership and our ability to adapt to what, what's being thrown at us in terms of the operational environment. Border Patrol has been in existence for nearly 100 years, right? This May will be, this next May will be 100 years. Customs, 200 years of service. The culture within both those organizations has always been rub some dirt on it, get it done. And you know what? We, we will continue to get it done. We will continue with that mantra. But we never really took time to stop and assess the wellness of our workforce, the resilience of our workforce. Whatever it is, whether it's generational or just, you know, times have changed, we really need to focus on our workforce. I, I believe, you know, I don't like to use the term resilience too much because my belief is that CBP has already proven that we are resilient. When you look back at COVID, the United States shut down. People were sent home, but CBP did not shut down. CBP officers and agents continued to work and do that job in spite of everything that was going on, in spite of all the difficulties that were surrounding you know, COVID. Our employees were face front with migrants coming in and dealing with that situation daily. CBP employees are resilient. CBP employees are dedicated. You will not find a more dedicated group of men and women in this, in this government to make sure that our homeland is secure. It's, that's, you know, goes without saying. So now my job is to come in and provide those support resources for those employees. You know, on top of the stressors of life, which we all have, you're dealing with the situation on the border, which entails thousands of migrants sitting in front of CBP employees every single day. Without getting into the details of too much information and data, I'll tell you right now, when you're averaging over 5,000 encounters on a daily basis, I want you to picture there is one CBP employee sitting in front of each one of those people every single day. Every single day, there is a touch point with a CBP employee. And every single day, our staff is dealing with the stories that those migrants have to say. This isn't making a political statement. This is putting it out there. There is not one story that is told to an agent that says my life is good. Not one. And our employees go home with that. That also bleeds on to our non-uniform staff because they're tasked with providing the support necessary for our employees. So when we talk about workforce care, I want to make very clear that our care is for all employees, both the non-uniformed and the uniformed personnel of CBP, because every single one of those is critical to the mission. Thank you. So 
The HD mentioned a couple of things that uh, are very meaningful. Dedicated workforce, resilient workforce, strong workforce. I would add that all of those are absolutely correct, but they also come at a cost. They come at a cost at the end of the day when that officer goes home to his or her family, uh, support infrastructure, and I mean, this is just a fact. Uh, as you said, rub dirt on it and keep on going. We are trained, they are trained to have a culture of strength, of dedication, of resilience. And what that mostly translates to is keeping it all inside. And that comes at a cost to the families, that comes at a cost to the individual officer, that comes to the cost of, of that nucleus. So saying that, how, how much outreach are we now doing, one, to the officer, which is critical, uh, ensuring that they trust us to support them, and then also the family. And, and, and the reason I mentioned the family, and I don't know if you've heard me say this before, I don't think any one of us could do the job that we're doing, that we have done or that we will do, without that support of that family group. How much a part of CBP do you consider the families of these officers to be? You, you know, Chief, I think it, it's, a, it's a great point. And if I could share, you know, a personal experience. So you mentioned last year I was, I was in El Paso as the acting chief. And, you know, when you're dealing with the numbers that we dealt with and the fact, you know, I'd go to every muster and, and talk with the troops. And, of course, they voiced their frustration, their concern. And it was on me to act. It was on me to make a decision. It didn't matter that my wife has supported me for all 26 years of my service. There is no one outside of work that really understood everything that we were dealing with. So that ability to vent isn't always readily available. That causes more stress in and of itself. And so by, by you know, obviously looking at what our culture is, we have to gain employee trust with the information they're going to provide us. We want to remove that stigma that is, if I ask for help, they're going to take my badge and gun away so that I have to sit behind a desk and answer phone calls. We definitely want to get away from that. We put too much money and effort into getting people hired and trained to turn around and remove them because they're not fit for duty. You know, organizationally, CBP, I think, has taken tremendous strides in some of the policy changes that we've put into place. You know, it's one thing to say, take care of your workforce. It's another thing to, to, to actually craft the policies that holds your leadership and management accountable to taking care of the workforce. You know, so that's, to me, that's a very critical piece, uh, gaining the employee trust and gaining the family trust. You know, if you have spouse or children that, that you know, if we can connect with them, I guarantee you that we'll connect with the employees. Uh, I recently had my team speak with a, a spouse, a surviving spouse of an employee who had committed suicide. And she had told us, if I knew of ways to connect with you, I could have told you when I started to see red flags. And that irks me because we could have saved somebody, right? I wanna make sure that I, we get out there, that our message is out there, that we're connecting with the families you know, because those are the first people that will notice a change in our workforce. Exactly. So there's the family, brother, sister, spouse, uh, an extended family, and then there's the CBP family. Uh, I met, and he's somewhere here a few minutes, uh, Kent, I believe, your communications uh, director. Uh, and when you introduced him to him, I was very glad to hear that you had a communications director because that is what's critical to both the family, biological family, and to the CBP family. Correct. So can you share with us what, what are the communication efforts that you're undertaking? Uh, and, and frankly, is there anything that industry might be able to help with? Training, support, whatever you think might, uh, might benefit. You know, when it comes to communication, right, the traditional medium for communication for us internally has always been an email. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I can tell you from, you know, my time in service, a Border Patrol agent comes into the office, goes to the armory, gets their equipment, goes to the muster room, gets their assignment, and gets their guidance, and then they go to the field. 
They don't sit in front of a computer to read the emails that my team is sending out. I know this. And so we're definitely looking at ways to connect with the employees on mobile applications, whether it's on their personal phone, on their government phone. Another piece, and I mentioned this before, is the trust piece. I want to be able to provide our employees with self-help tools that are at the tips of their fingers rather than having them come in, right? If I can get their trust first to access self-help on an application, that'll open the door to gaining that trust where I can get them in front of a clinician or a doctor. Mm. You know, so it's, it's important to, to make sure that I'm providing that support. Another piece that we're working on, and this is a study that, that you know, is pretty much the, the, the story throughout all law enforcement, sleep. Our workforce isn't getting the right amount of sleep. And if they don't get the right amount of sleep because of the stress that they're dealing with, they're not going to come to work and be 100%. And so, you know, what, what technology is out there in terms of wearable technology that can give me some of that aggregate data, you know, that we can actually focus and, and, and turn into action with programs and resources. I mean, these are all things that we're looking at, you know, going forward. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking here as, 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 as Pete is, uh, Peter is uh, talking, uh, just, just to give this group a, a sense I was a sitting chief when uh, the day that we signed the Border Patrol Foundation into an entity, that day one of our officers was ambushed, shot, and killed in California. Um, had the job, of course, of notifications and things of that nature. We, didn't, we weren't anywhere close to what we are today. And it was, it, it's, it's the most difficult job that any anybody can do, notifying the family. But getting back to the concept of family, and I, I won't mention names, uh, when I spoke to the spouse, I said what I felt I needed to say, but I was astounded that when she did respond, the second question she had was, how are the rest of the agents doing? Because, and to this day, she still cares about the foundation and what we're doing. And every time that a suicide occurs, we hear from family members. So that's how close this, this, this uh, and tight knit this, this family unit is. Um, and the reason I mention that is you mentioned suicides. Uh, and we talked about this earlier, whether we could talk, uh, talk about that because it's a touchy subject. And you said yes, and thank you for that because I think we should be able to talk about suicides. What can you tell us about what is happening and what we might, we industry might be able to do to, to, to assist in any way? You know, we've seen a couple of pieces on, on, on technology with the delivery of training. So most oftentimes we do training on the computer. You go into a system, you play a couple of videos, you click some answers, you're completed with the training, it's a requirement, it's done. This year we took a change in direction and actually implemented a mandate that every single CBP employee was gonna go through in-person suicide and awareness training. This is step one. This is critical because it made everybody sit in a class and actually engage firsthand with someone who had an experience or background in this field. What I look at other opportunities are, you know, um, I've actually, tried training through an oculus and i can tell you that from my perspective when you're speaking with someone who's contemplating suicide or having those ideations that conversation is never easy and there's certain things that you can say that can trigger a person to walk away and never seek your help again and so putting our employees through some sort of training like that first person training would definitely assist in kind of getting them that perspective so they know what they're getting into when they have that hard conversation because we could see the signs of suicide, but how many people are actually going to take the time to engage or say, ah, someone else will talk to them. I don't know that I can handle this conversation. It happens. You know, so we definitely look at those things. And like I said, any wearable technology that lets us know when an employee's heart rate, emotions change, you know, but all this is very sensitive information that employees don't want to share, right? 
And so again, we go back to the trust piece and the culture piece, making sure that what, whatever information we get, we don't use it against the employees. Okay. So, and I know you've gone through the same thing. Uh, throughout careers within military law enforcement, federal law enforcement, life balance is, is, is becomes a, a challenge. One of the one of the biggest challenges that uh, personally I had was moving my family a total of ten times yes. over that 30, 35 year career. Uh, very difficult coming home and telling my junior high, freshman, and elementary school child that we're moving again. Life balance. What? What is it that we can do, when I say we, now I'm talking the organization, to help manage that life balance? Having that officer, that agent, that, that representative of CBP uh, recognize that that life balance is as important as carrying out those duties that are expected of him or her. Well, you know, we have a lot of programs in our, in our uh, portfolio that really are put there to help the employee and the families. You know, the road to suicide is not linear, right? I mean, there are so many ways that an employee could get to that, and so many triggers, right? Whether it be financial, domestic, uh, you know, dealing with your children, um, work just compounds that. Mm -hmm. And so, given the training and the ability for our employees to have someone to connect with, to learn what what tools they can use to deal with those situations, I mean. I'm not sitting here telling you that we're going to wipe away everybody's struggles. That's not, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what I want to tell you and, and everybody is that I'm going to do my best to give the workforce the tools that they need to help get through life, right? To get through life and, and succeed and do better. Come to work in a better mindset. Come to work and give us their 100%, right? And then balance that with life. We've got, for example, backup care. You know, a big issue within the Border Patrol from when I was in the organization was child care. Something so simple, but it causes a lot of stress when you're on a rotating shift and you don't get weekends and holidays off. You know, you're working midnights. CBP is 24-7 and daycare is not. And how can we better improve that capability, right? How can we improve the tools? We're, we're exploring options to try and make that, uh, you know, more accessible. You know, clinical support. Again, 24-7 mission. If a person's on midnights, who can they call at midnight to get help? You know, I want to make sure that our tools are accessible and readily available for the employees whenever they need them. Whenever, wherever they need them, yeah. So I'm going to encourage industry. You, you heard the chief this morning talk about the challenges that our men and women have. You have heard the challenges that we have on taking care of our men and women. You may not be in this industry of, 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 uh, of uh, life balance and, and, and workforce wellness and stuff, things of that nature, but you're a part of the family. The chief said it this morning, you're a critical part of that family of helping us get our job done. This is a big part of helping CBP get their job done. So I would invite you, I would challenge you, anything that you think you can do, whether it is because you provide it or you think of something, please, and I don't do this often, I beg of you, please help them take care of your family, that protects your family, that you're a big part of. Director. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. you very much. Thank you Best much. of luck going forward. Thanks, Appreciate you doing this.